Hello and welcome to MCA Services. In this presentation we're going to be extending on the topic of BET surface area measurement and we're going to consider the analysis of particularly low surface area materials. Now don't forget to view our other videos, especially the introduction to BET surface area as it gives more background to this and more information as ever is available on our website via the links in the presentation and below. So the first question is why would we use something other than nitrogen? The majority of gas adsorption analyses use nitrogen as the adsorbate and for very good reasons. So some examples of nitrogen adsorption desorption isotherms are for battery cathode materials, this is a high area metal oxide, zeolites, this is a Y type zeolite, activated carbons and even a mesoporous silica. Using nitrogen means that we can measure the full adsorption and desorption isotherms and apply a wide range of pore models to investigate pore size distributions, pore volume, as well as the surface area. They're all critical to fully understanding the porous nature of many materials. And these isotherms look very different because these materials have very different porous characteristics. But they do have one thing in common, and that's quite a high surface area. 93 square metres per gram for the cathode material, 502 for the zeolite, 1300 for the activated carbon, and 950 for the mesoporous silica. Not all of the samples we analyse here at MCA Services have high surface areas. We routinely analyse samples with BET areas below 10 square metres per gram, even below 1 square metre per gram. Surface area is still critical to the understanding, the development and the production of many, many materials with a wide variety of applications and from a diverse range of industries. This is an isotherm of a very common over-the-counter pharmaceutical. The BET area is, is quite low, 1.2 square metres per gram, and combined with the isotherm profile, the sample would appear to be quite non-porous. But the BET surface area is still very important. It helps to understand the function and the efficiency of the pharmaceutical, and it's also used extensively through the development and the manufacturing process. But in terms of surface area, just how low can you go with nitrogen? To illustrate the problem of applying nitrogen adsorption to very low surface area samples, we've analysed the low area polymer powder sample. The nitrogen adsorption desorption isotherm is shown here on the left, and we can see that adsorption volumes are very, very low. The isotherm is very irregular, and it appears that the adsorption isotherm actually shows a decrease in volume between 0.1 and 0.5 relative pressure. And of course, in reality, that just isn't possible. We can still apply BET theory to the data, and the BET transform plot is shown on the right. The transform relative pressure data does not fit at all well to the regression line, and we can see that the y-intercept is negative. Consequently, the BETC value is negative, which is theoretically impossible, as it would mean a negative heat of adsorption. BET area is still calculated from this at 0.003 square metres per gram, but given the poor fit to the regression line, the poor co correlation coefficient, the negative C value, and the general isotherm profile, we have to consider that this is just erroneous and is not a true representation of the sample surface area. To understand why nitrogen will give unreliable adsorption data at low adsorption volumes, and therefore low area materials, we need to look at the instrumentation. So this is a schematic diagram of the sample arrangement using a typical gas adsorption analyzer. The sample is shown as the green spheres sitting in the sample tube. The bottom part of the tube, including the sample, is within a dewer filled, in this case, with liquid nitrogen. The open-ended top of the tube is secured to the analyzer, and there's a transducer monitoring the pressure within the tube. And this is essential for gathering our relative pressure data and ensuring that equilibrium has been attained for each relative pressure we're being, we are measuring. The blue circle at the top represents a valve which opens when we need to dose adsorbate to the tube. So if we admit adsorbate gas to the analysis tube, and that's shown here as the red dots, we find that at equilibrium, some atoms will be adsorbed onto the sample, whereas others will remain within the analysis tube, not adsorbed to the sample. 
The portion of the tube that does not contain sample is called the free space. Note that the transducer is measuring the pressure within the entire tube, which is converted to a volume within the entire tube for each adsorption relative pressure of the isotherm. So to find the volume ad adsorbed to the sample, we must subtract the free space volume from the total volume of adsorbate dosed into the tube at every relative pressure analysed. Free space at the analysis temperature is not the same as the empty tube volume at room temperature though, and that's because there's a thermal gradient along the length of the tube. The bottom part is at 77 Kelvin, whereas the top part is closer to ambient. Thankfully the analysis will include a step for the measurement of free space, and that's usually taken before we commence dosing the adsorbate to measure the isotherm, and that takes care of both the room temperature and the 77 Kelvin components. The problem with low surface area materials is that the volume adsorbed onto the sample becomes very small relative to the analysis tube, the free space volume. As we increase the relative pressure, we will find that although the volume adsorbed onto the sample increases, so too does the volume, and therefore the number of molecules, in the free space. Once the number of atoms or molecules adsorbed onto the sample becomes very small relative to the number within the free space, we can no longer ascertain the number adsorbed to the sample accurately. At this point, we can no longer gather reliable and accurate adsorption isotherm data. Now, we can undertake various measures to reduce the free space and maintain stability within the system. For example, the micrometrics instruments we use at MCA are manufactured to have very low dead volumes and maintain excellent thermal and pressure stability. We can introduce filler rods to the analysis tube. These are essentially solid rods which occupy a large portion of the free space volume within the tube and significantly reduce it. Using micrometrics instruments also means that we can insert isothermal jackets. Now these sit around the outside of the analysis tube and act as, as a wick, maintaining a constant cryogen level. This means that thermal stability and accuracy of the free space measurement are constant throughout the analysis. Even as the level of liquid nitrogen in the dew naturally falls over time due to evaporation. Improvements in instrumentation mean that the lower limit at which, nit at which nitrogen can be confidently used for the surface area measurement has fallen dramatically. A few decades ago, surface areas below 10 square metres per gram were considered difficult to measure. Now we can comfortably and confidently measure below 1 square metre per gram with nitrogen. However, there is still a lower limit to which nitrogen adsorption becomes unreliable. This depends on the nature of the sample material, its affinity for adsorbing nitrogen, and the amount we can re reasonably fit in the analysis tube. A low density sample will mean that we must use a lower sample mass, and therefore we will have a smaller sample area present for adsorption. It is, however, reasonable to say that any surface area measured by nitrogen uh, to be around about 0.5 square metres per gram or lower must be rather carefully inspected and considered with caution. But there is an alternative. The number of adsorbate atoms or molecules present in the free space of the analysis tube at any, any relative pressure is dictated in part by the saturation vapour pressure of the adsorbate. For nitrogen, this is a little above atmospheric pressure. But for sake of arguments, let's assume this to be 760 millimetres of mercury pressure. Krypton, on the other hand, has a very low saturation of vapor pressure, typically 2.3 millimetres of mercury. The consequence of this is that any given relative pressure, there will be about 330 times fewer krypton atoms in the free space of the analysis tube than there would be for nitrogen molecules, for the same degree of surface coverage of the sample. Ultimately, this means that with krypton, the number of atoms adsorbed on the surface is now much larger relative to the number of atoms in the free space, and the isotherm becomes much, much more reliable for the calculation of BET surface area. So finally, we're going to show an example of krypton adsorption being very useful when the surface area of a sample is too low for reliable and accurate measurement by nitrogen adsorption. This is the nitrogen adsorption of a metal oxide powder, 
and we can see it's, it's a very regular isotherm due to the free space correction errors discussed above. However, the krypton adsorption isotherm of the sample is much, much more reliable. It shows a good curvature at low relative pressure, followed by a good linearity as relative pressures increase. Now, it's worth noting that these isotherms are only shown to 0.4 relative pressure, and this is because the relative pressure range of krypton adsorption is limited. For krypton analysis, just like nitrogen, we've used liquid nitrogen as the cryogen. That's the standard technique for both adsorbates. But 77 Kelvin is below the triple point of krypton, and so we would find that at some point it would solidify in the analysis tube. And this is a, a visual effect called the krypton snowstorm. This occurs at approximately 0.5 relative pressure, so it's sensible to collect isotherms below this. Since the relative pressure range we can analyse encompasses the BET range, krypton does remain a valuable tool for low area BET surface area analysis. So if we move to look at the BET transform plots of each of these isotherms and the resulting BET surface area data, we can see that for nitrogen adsorption, it's not possible to generate reliable data. Even using just the lowest five relative pressure data points, shown as the red circles, the BET value, uh, BETC value is negative. The correlation coefficient is very poor. If we were to just use the lowest two relative data points, we could obtain a positive C value of 625 and, of course, a perfect correlation coefficient. But in this case, the BET surface area is calculated to be 0.027 square metres per gram, but must only be considered to be completely unreliable. The BET transform plot for krypton, on the other hand, is totally different, as we would expect from a reliable looking isotherm. Now the BET range can be fitted with good linearity throughout a significant number of relative pressure data points, shown by the blue circles. The BETC value is 0 0.081 square metres per gram. The BETC value is positive, and the correlation coefficient is high. So we can say with confidence that the BET surface area of this material is much better represented by krypton adsorption than it is by nitrogen adsorption. So in this presentation, we've shown the limits of applying nitrogen adsorption isotherms to the calculation of BET surface area of low area samples and why krypton adsorption becomes really useful. We hope that this has been useful to you and thank you for watching and don't forget more information is available on our website 